Hey everyone. Here we are again. I can't believe it. It seems like a week since the last time we did it. <laughs> oh, oh, oh god. Oh god. Uh, yes. You can tell he's a father. Yeah. Did you, did you turn off uh, your phones, chaps? No, I turned it my, I on so that it's recording. Oh, very Ready. good. I have mine off. I'm just going to take the risk that I'm, I'm being recorded perfectly fine. Um, how's things, lads? Did you have good. a very exciting week? Oh, yeah. lots of bits and pieces yeah. this end. Um, how about you? It's, if if people ask that question, you can absolutely guarantee they've actually... I have my answer ready. They're, <laughs> they're, 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 they're chomping at the bit. Uh, to try um, and however, get, to get I'm going to really else. upset yeah. him. Um, I'm going to really upset him because I'm going to give him the lowdown for my last week of travelling around whilst being off work. Uh, just... <laughs> oh, no, no. Give me strength. So <laughs> I started on Monday with. Yeah. <laughs> so go on, come on, Connor. You, oh, you, come on, you've so got good. something really. <laughs> I don't have anything that interesting to say, but it's kind of it's pertinent to what we're talking about tonight. So I just wanted it's to. It's never, uh, it's never stopped you before. <laughs> Come on. Oh, oh, this is a horrific start <laughs> of life. I see you guys have been angling. There's something wrong. Um, I uh, I was on that. I was on with uh, Becker and Bib there on Sunday, and we were talking about fish oil supplements. So I just thought, how relative to tonight when you know that's one of the first things we reach for when your dog is suffering from uh, joint pain, and fish oil supplements would be the very first groovy thing that we would reach for because we mm -hmm. know it absolutely mm -hmm. helps with arthritis. It helps with inflammation, mm -hmm. like a fire extinguisher yeah. for the body, isn't it? And so many cereal fed dogs, particularly, yeah. but also raw fed dogs, if your meat is coming from indoors and that sort of stuff, you know, going to be low in omega three higher in omega-6 if you're fed grain and all this crap. So there's lots of reasons why you would use fish oil in this condition and not to ruin what we might be talking about later on. But it was so interesting because they had on a fish oil expert. And I thought, how could you be a fish oil expert? This guy had a fish oil company since the time he was a kid and uh, <laughs> immensely successful. But the guy is a is a lipidologist. Would that be the right word? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, uh, and oh, my God, uh, it, was, it was so interesting. So they picked out the 12 top fish oil brands in the U.S. They said, right, they quizzed everybody, they said, millions of followers. What are your top 12 favorites? And we went through them one by one. And so I went through them from my with my hat on as a, as a pet owner type thing. This is what I would, you know, I'm looking at Omega 3 bang per book and I'm, you know, but this guy gets into, is it ethyl ester or is it triglyceride? Different productions. So ethyl ester is your refined oils. How do they make them concentrated? They refine the shit out of them. And I was like, oh, what does that mean? They said, well, this is the process. This is the result. The bioavailability is much less. It's cheaper to produce. It's easier to, and everything, the storage is much worse, easier to oxidize. I was like, this is terrible. And then he goes, plastic bottles, they let oxygen in. And I'm like, what? And he goes, yeah, glass isn't porous, but plastic is. And he goes, particularly if, you're a plas if your plastic has a squidgy top on the top of dropper, because that's mm -hmm. every, like, we all know that from when you did science in college. You'd always thought those rotten dropper bottles. If you were last mm -hmm. to the shelf yeah. to get your dropper, some of them were rotten because oil hates plastic. And uh, had little tiny tips like that. And I just thought, wow, I didn't know any of this. And so uh, it was fascinating uh, to, to learn about that. And then I stumbled into agreeing the puzzle bit, which we're going to talk about later. So that's what I was up to during the week. Three hours of talking about fish oil supplements. Who would have thought? Uh, wow yeah so but it was would, really, would he come on with all... us would he come on with us sure we think? can get him on absolutely shall we drag yeah. can you yeah. can you ask him we want a lipidologist on? yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It was just so interesting because he was just like straight down the middle this is the story with this and but also like you know even habib was saying you know uh they got the the product the plastic the chemicals in the packaging of the pet food is, is leaking into the pet food so which is a problem mm -hmm. and that's fat's mm -hmm. fault because fat likes to leach that plastic off and so you know that's a big big problem so okay that's one one thing but then he was saying that the studies showing that the plastic bag of pet food is leaking contaminants into the household and that the pets and children living in the household with kibble, bags of kibble, are higher in these nasty contaminants because the bag is leaking Ooh. the stuff out. And I just thought, this is glorious. Why have I never heard this before? Yeah, EPA yeah. and phthalates yeah. everywhere. I Phalates. didn't know. And yes. I thought, this is a gem. So, um, but he was explaining why fat does that. And I'm like, oh, this is and just, just fiercely interesting. But you would have loved the, the danger of the refinement of it. And the fat just hates being outside the body let's face it do, you know so. do, do you know remember um a couple of weeks ago when we did the new things for the new year okay and we talked about um you know 
whether we're going to maybe cut out dairy, things like that. And I talked about, you know, uh, making your coffee keto, you know, adding butter and uh, you can mix it up with um, MCT and things like uh, that. Collagens and MCT. So yeah. just just a, a warning, you know, if you don't have a um, let's not name the brand, but a blitzer. OK, that has a metal thing to blitz in. I soon discovered that this stuff dissolves the plastic cup <laughs> that sits <laughs> on the top. That's interesting. He actually made more of that. Know, you, just, you, you basically, so as you see it slowly deteriorate, you get little cracks appearing in all of the stuff, and it's you can see wow. that it literally is deteriorating Crazy. Um, wow. over, the, over the weeks. So, uh, yeah, a little warning out there. If you don't think that that plastic cup can ever give stuff into your food, I know You're you can wrong. dissolve them. He actually, so the, <laughs> therefore, is is the take home message here is if you've got fats of any, so that that means oils, fats, whatever, do not have it anywhere near plastic. It has to be near glass. Yeah. Is glass the only inert? Is that the only yeah. thing that will do it? I asked him what his favorite would be. Just you know, uh, oh, metal. and a metal brush does brush metal, but the metal is often lined with plastic, BPA free. But if you're containing the fat, but also you'll have a plastic uh, pump on the top. And he said yeah. the problem is there's two types of pumps. He says one pump, which 99% of products use, has it just pumps and squirts, but there's a layer of fat at the bottom of it blocking the rest. Like it, it doesn't have a seal that shoots across the top. So it, that bit there is oxidizing all the way down the tube. So he says okay. they're actually nasty. They're just exposed to the air. That It takes that one little bit and now air is getting in. So it's not sealed if you have a pump. You have to have an oxygen, uh, a seal proof. It'll say it on the label, like Mercola's krill oil will say. You've paid much more for this bottle, but the pump is oxygen kind of, you know, it doesn't let the oxygen in. So it's like, bloody hell, what can we do here? What's the solution? And he goes, honestly, capsules in a glass jar with a metal lid uh, kept it kept yeah. in the fridge. And, and it was so disappointing was because surprised. there was there was a company that used to do the omega-3 oils for heart stuff inside. So in the um, inner container was effectively a flexible plastic liner. And they used to pump oxygen into the outside of that liner so that actually the pressure built outside it which pumps the oil out and that's how they um they tried to keep it from oxidizing ah. it would stay last longer in the interesting um, pot but some really interesting stuff because i i got super concerned with the level of oxidation of of oils um and especially after the shanahan book and yeah. uh, they sort of like super conscious about, you know, for companies that are putting oils into the food about the consideration of nitrogen flushing, which is effectively loading the, the top layer of the, the thing in, in nitrogen rather than allowing oxygen to get in. Or indeed, you know, even flushing with, with nitrogen gas so an inert gas into the plastic containers to try and yeah. optimize the, yeah. um, uh, what's going on. But we actually did a trial through that, you know, the heat of that summer. Okay. And we actually uh, had a little look at the remnants of herring oil in one of these um, large drums that you get. So that, you know, not small, insignificant amounts, you know, 50 litre drums. And after three weeks of uh, utilising it, we looked at the bottom layer without nitrogen flushing. And actually, uh, they still had a minute amount of oxidation it wasn't oxidized very much at all mm, okay and that was kept it ambient so yeah I'm, I'm still out there i think we need to do more research to find out yeah. that level of acidity and is that because the, the packaging was so good bren or is that because herring oil is innately resistant to oxidation would you say well, I, I don't know whether it's, um, I mean, admittedly, it's a cool warehouse. It was not the 40 degrees that was going mm, on through the mm, summer, but mm -hmm. it was not, you know, in the freezer part. And yeah. it was not, um, you know, the packaging, reasonable. You know, they weren't pumping oxygen in. Um, you know, they were just drawing mm, it off. Mm. If, you, um, if you look at uh, if you look at off-the-shelf fish supplements, more than one in 10 fish oil supplements in the EU, 60 tested, nearly half are just under the recommended maximum limit for oxidation. Okay, that's according to the independent. Here's another one. Um, and what's that maximum limit? I don't know what it is. Um, a combination of, I didn't write that, didn't take it down. A combination of global studies since 2015 show that on average, 20% of fish oil products have XX oxidation. In other words, they're worse off your pet when you feed them. So hmm. this is just really, so one in five chance. And so you've got to, 
you've got a 50 50 chance if the oil is really really fresh so he said even if the product says keep it at room temperature because you're insane put it in the fridge it slows down oxidation because don't keep it at room temperature because they say you can it's just a ridiculous thing that manufacturers have started saying he says dark glass bottle in the fridge and anything that lasts for years, worry about it. He actually started with the with your two cups, two polystyrene, uh, two glass beakers, one with ethyl ester, the refined fish oil, and one with normal triglyceride fish oil, which is just the actual fish fat, in two beakers. They look the exact same, and he put a piece of polystyrene in each one. And as he was talking, the piece of polystyrene in the ethyl ester refined one dissolved and disappeared. A piece of polystyrene. So he said, wow. like, it's not good stuff. So uh, oh, I just learned so much. It was very, very interesting. So I've yeah, just have to worry about so. chemical extraction. I'm Absolutely. just going to say this. We've got this product here. It is uh, krill oil. It's in a, a, a brushed aluminium. Um, show oh, that. Can you see that? Hold on. Uh, with with a, an aluminium lid as nice. well. Yeah. Looks so good. that should be. Yeah, because an aluminium oxide is very, very inert. Yeah. So if any anybody needs a bit of that, then just let me know. What's the website, Nick? Uh, uh, no, email me Nick Thompson at holisticvet co uk. Nick very Thompson good. at holisticvet co uk. So that's good. That's a really nice intro, Connor. Yeah. Thank Before we go any further, guys. check 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 at the bottom there, guys. Patreon.com forward slash raw pet medics. We deeply appreciate any support you can give us, guys. We are not a paid show, but if you can't afford the price of a cup of tea or a cup of coffee, we absolutely appreciate it. this. Size helps us do our thing. As uh, and also you hear our podcast uh, anywhere you can vote for our podcast. We really appreciate it. Give it the five stars that kind of jazz uh, it really helps us move up those lists and we are but until we get to number one we're not going to talk about those positions anymore but uh, <laughs> yeah I, we are moving up though i'm keeping track how are we doing Let's, in, to, so in we, tobago are we still number one in tobago yeah trinidad tobago we were number two i think in the in the pet section so we oh, just we, need a couple more votes guys so we need to yeah. be there, number one dr yeah. judy was number one <laughs> <laughs> yeah never, never gonna get there yeah so who wants oh, to start so, us off guys on a bit of hip well i think nick you've got some great x-rays got, i think we I've did got, start off on the deep end let's go back to um what we should be talking about shall we talk i'm just going to give a very broad view uh, with a few x-rays here. We've got those. Bren, can we blow those up? And I'll just take the guys through those. There we go. Okay, so there you go. On the right-hand side, you can see an exquisitely good x-ray. You see how detailed it is and where it's the so blacks clear. are black and the whites are white and what have you. That's a really, really nice x-ray. It it it, we selected it. Not only is it nice x-ray, but you've got really nice hips. Uh, the hip is a ball and socket joint. You see, the hips are one third of the way down there. You've got the the the, the hip joints are, are there. You've got the pelvis, which is that kind of amazing, looks like a, a a screaming man upside down. I've only I've only just seen that for the first time <laughs> in my life. You know the <gasps> that, yeah. that that famous <laughs> that famous photo. If you turn that upside down, that's what you've got there. And the fact that it's so symmetrical on that on that X ray shows that whoever took it is very very good because they lined it up really well. What you're looking for in a ball and socket joint is you've got a ball like this, and you've got a socket like this, and you want that ball to fit beautifully in the socket such that you get really nice motion. You've got a solidity so that you can go belting down the field and your, your your hips don't fall out um you've got good uh, you've got good grip because all the soft tissue comes i need a third hand here you got all this all the soft tissue is around there you can't see it on an x-ray but the soft tissue is what keeps it all together it's just a good seat in there is what you're looking for and when you don't have those things when you've got you've got a, a either a shallow uh socket yeah so this is a good deep socket like this not too deep because otherwise you go the other way but just right yeah goldilocks socket if you go if you've got a shallow socket the ball is going to go like this or if you've got a decent socket and you've got quite a a flat uh uh, ball then it's going to go clunking around causing lots of cytokine storms and uh, connor will tell you about that in a second i'm sure also the angle of the hip is there's just a perfect angle there's a name for the angle. I can't remember it because I haven't taken it. Uh, and, and hip dysplasia x-ray for probably 20 years. Cronenberg angle, something like that. 
Bren will no doubt tell us, this angle has to be perfect because it needs to align perfectly there, such that you, such that the dog can 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 put their hips right into the pelvic socket and then have nice straight legs going down. And as you see there, on that on that second X-ray, the the uh, the socket is shallow. Ooh. The ball is not a ball. It looks more like a a, a, a deflated tennis ball. The the angle is poor, and so those are really pretty poor hips. Does that mean that the dog is going to be absolutely terrible for the rest of their lives? Not necessarily. There's a lot that you can do, and that's what we're going to be talking about today. We're going to be talking about nutrition. We're going to be talking about acupuncture. We're going to be talking about hydrotherapy. We're going to talk about physio and chiropractic and osteopathy and all these amazing things because sometimes you can get these guys through you can just kind of keep going keep going and support here and support here and support and that you can you can get through but there are there are lots of things that you can do if the dog has got a degree of dysplasia it is not the end of the world if they've got really bad dysplasia they probably will need some kind of surgical intervention at some point uh if you're unlucky so there you go that's just a very brief how long was that? Three minute interview. That was great, Brady. Yeah. That's how you do a brief interview. Uh, <laughs> a brief. That's how you I do, can do a brief. A brief. That's how you do a brief intro. <laughs> I can do a brief. Okay. So, so, so I was so I was only finding sharps angle, which relates oh, to the sharps angle. Oh, very nice. Very Is nice. The... There you go. Gives you the difference of. Do you see what I mean? Sorry. This is what I was. You know, I was talking about yeah. this. So if it's too, if it's too upright, you're, you're standing like this. If it's like this, then then there's the pressure on top of that hip from from the rest of the body is 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 really high, and so you may get weakening here. And if you're going to break, you might break over here. So there's just that sweet spot, just in between the too too far up, too far down. It's all about engineering, and this is and 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 orthopedic surgeons get very excited because it's architecture, and it's and they can do lots with it, and they can put lots of bits of bits of metal and what oh, have I you love in my there. Power tools when it comes to orthopedics. Yeah. Oh, so, um, so uh, there you go. There's a little introduction. You can tell we haven't actually planned this. Who wants to go next? With uh, the, the, uh, Brent, do you want to give us a little bit of physiology of of of, of bone and cartilage and maybe how they grow and and um, spaying and and what? have you what happens if you spay dogs early does that affect the hips yeah okay so um i would say so the next part really is going to be a understanding bone is not dead okay this is a living part yes. you know it's fully you know it's protein it's mineralized protein but it's only mineralized because in it there are cells which are alive, actively interacting with that bone, which allows that bone to fix. You know, if you break a bone, you want to be able to fix it. OK, now for the joint itself, we need a little bit of cushioning. And those very similar cells, the chondrocytes, actually line that area of subchondral bone uh, and they produce, they utilize um, the nutrients to produce a nice firm cartilage. Now, dependent on um, some other genetics that may be a weaker cartilage. And there are some genetic testings uh, that you can do for your dogs to see if they're predisposed to osteochondrosis dissecans, which is a uh, delaminating of that cartilage within the joint. Um, there is also a um, test that you can do to x-ray your dog and to get all of those angles measured so in the uk that's done by the british veterinary association uh, certain x-rays need to be taken at particular angles uh, in order for us to send those x-rays off and get them scored and so certainly if you're breeding you might consider that although there was a bit of debate as to whether that was working for labradors because they used to mm. have a lovely scoring system of trying to say look the average breed is 32 if you can breed below 16 then surely we're going to slowly improve the labrador population um and i think 15 years into that uh, little experiment of trying to do that uh, what did they find but labrador hips were just getting worse now a couple of things around that okay that weren't examined uh were things like um, nutrition 
you know, what yeah. we're doing with nutrition, you know, the change of nutrition, um, <laughs> increasing kibble foods uh, that were going on, uh, some of the differences uh, as well in um, the life stages that they were giving, whether those life stage diets were appropriate for that gro those growing dogs. Now, obviously, on mm. top of that, we've put another layer, um, which is obviously not for breeding dogs, but we're talking about neutering. And so those great um, research papers done. I know some people don't like corporates, but one thing about the, you know, the corporates in America that actually dared to look at their data um, to find out were they giving the right advice uh, and came up with those papers around, yes, tumors and things like that with regards to um, neutering, but actually more importantly, joint disease. One of the reasons we were seeing increased cruciate ruptures, but also that reflected on hip dysplasia, uh, elbow dysplasia uh, within some of these breeds. So neutering definitively will have an effect. And as I said, these are living parts of the body and those hormones are going to have a growth effect on the system. OK, so, you know, for, for both males and females, uh, it does have an effect. Twice as likely. The figures that I've seen, if you if you neuter really early, kind of nine weeks, 12 weeks, what have you, you can be up to twice as likely to get. So that's a 100 percent increase in incidence of uh, hip dysplasia if you dare to neuter at that that level. So yeah, be there's, careful. There's, there's lots of studies there to support exactly what you're saying there. Um, it's the number two um, kind of when it comes to side effect counting the mental studies to to kind of go against the idea of neutering dogs, abnormal bone growth and development. The very first one out of the traps is that early neutered animals are taller because when you neuter an animal or spay, you're going to uh, remove uh, estrogen and estrogen tells the bones to stop growing, doesn't it? So that's what closes the growth plate. So you have these taller animals and they're more sub uh, susceptible to joint issues. They're more susceptible yeah. to uh, increased cruciate rupture. Uh, yeah. This guy had a look. Yeah, there's four huge studies here. Um, uh, whether the biggest one was 759 golden retrievers followed for a few years. Um, and so like it, we know that it's, it's increasing cruciate rupture and all that, but to get to the uh, hip dysplasia one, here's some nice studies here. Uh, can we get some figures um, in their study of 759 retrievers? They noted early neutered males were 10% more likely to get hip dysplasia. That's not, doesn't sound like too bad actually, or 10% were diagnosed with hip dysplasia. Um, and a study of 1800 and uh, did higher incidence of hip dysplasia than non neutered animals. So, yeah, it's, it's definitely happening. Uh, the, both yeah. the, and that the growth, as, as Michelle said, is, is round the growth plates. And what we saw, certainly, uh, I've seen in male dogs, is if you um, neuter them early, you can actually delay the closure of those growth plates. So, mm. they actually end up continuing to grow um, because they haven't had that instruction to sort of like calcify the the bones and close those growth plates yeah so the hence they're hence they're taller mm. yeah okay there's a Great. there's a there's another one from a causing point of view nick just mentioned about the nutrition um it's it's interesting like this has been around since 2014 one of dog risks first uh studies that they came out with uh, i think it was actually a master's i'm not sure if it was ever published or not but there was a survey sent out to 254 i believe uh german shepherd owners and uh, they found like just it was really, really clear that um, raw feeding raw food was protective to uh, chronic hip dysplasia for whatever reason. But what's interesting was they included kibble in there as one of the diets to select raw food and cooked food. And do you know what diet came out the worst of those three? Cooked. Cooked cooked did come out the worst. And I thought how very interesting. And it brings me to a point that. When people are feeding cooked food to dogs and they say, OK, I can't feed bone to dogs for whatever reason. And so they go looking for a bone substitute and they read online and they say, well, give a bit of eggshell. And I say, OK, you've replaced the calcium. And it's like, but you haven't replaced like chondroitin or collagen or the glucagon, glutine, all the cool hyaluronic acid. Where are you getting all that stuff if you're not feeding bone? So, so that membrane on the inside of the egg. Mm, uh, yes, pure chondroitin, <laughs> pure chondroitin. And studies show all that stuff is fantastic for your arthritis. But even mm. then, like you're picking out individual things. 
Uh, so people buy calcium supplements. They feed seaweed because some seaweeds are higher in calcium. But that is just focusing on one single nutrient, whereas a joint is made up of many different building blocks. And you need all those things. So just like me trying to get over my knee as a vegetarian, uh, same knee operation three times in a row. I never fed myself glucosamine and chondroitin and hyaluronic acid. A couple of supplements for the first week or two. And then I just assumed I was getting it in my diet. Never thought. So you can't actually replace bone too easily. And I wonder, is that a problem with the people that were feeding cooked diets? These were Scandinavian, so I think they're more likely to feed bone. But if you're on a cooked diet, you're probably not feeding raw bone. And you probably thought that putting calcium into your diet would be enough to replace uh, a vital kind of nutrient for a, a vital food source for for dogs. So it was very interesting that they were these are very significant p values as well. I mean, this was very definitely uh, raw was very protective for these German Shepherd owners, and cooked was the opposite. And I just thought, oh, well, that was very interesting. From a, from a this is good. Movie. This is good. To quote the study, it says this study suggests that feeding a bone and raw food diet or raw meat, raw offal, raw bone and raw cartilage, raw fish, raw egg and raw tripe as supplementation to other diets or as part of the bath diet showed protective effects versus uh, canine, uh, hip dysplasia. And then, as Connor mentioned, the cooked was actually was worsening but it says remarkably feeding dry commercial food was common in both case and control groups and did not show any association with with um canine hip dysplasia in this no, study. no significant how amazing if, is that how if amazing you, if you look at the graph of that nick okay now this is 254 mm. dogs so it sounds like mm. a lot but when you're divided into four different diet groups you're limiting who's in each group that's not a huge yeah. amount of and in the commercial yeah. dry food the, the amount of hip dysplasia was 69 versus 61 so that is when you look at the charts you go oh that's quite a big difference so that is getting they would say close to significant that would be something where you go okay let's increase the sample size do another study of that to increase the sample size to a thousand and tell us if that is significant or not it looks quite quite a hefty uh difference to me but it's not significant and you do have to go to give them their dues they did better than the cook diet so that is interesting when i wouldn't have thought dry food was put it in you know the glucosamine chondroitin that goes in their orthopedic food that you buy for dogs with arthritis doesn't it you know they're not i wonder i wonder, I wonder whether royal canon or similar would be inclined to do such a study uh, with their foods versus raw food. They would with their orthopedic food. That's what would support their prescription brand orthopedic food. They put in the nutrients that are missing from their standard diets. And they, okay. uh, yeah, and that's how you come up with this orthopedic food clinically proven to be good for dogs with joint disease. That's because glucosamine, chondroitin, hyaluronic acid, all those things can help a little bit to take the pain away. Or to... well, it's interesting this because some of the companies actually for those processed diets, it's not actually the chondroitin and things that they look at. The biggest gain was actually back to the beginning of tonight is the oils oh, yeah, the for sure. yeah. you know going in so those are the biggest gains uh, beth actually raises something interesting because um yeah what in your opinion therefore if you're going to substitute bone raw bone into this diet okay ground or macerated or however you want to put it instead of eggshell mm. do you feel you're you've got enough in there or is there anything else you need to substitute in because yeah. really, eggshell is calcium carbonate. Yeah. I wouldn't so, use eggshell. The, the, the yeah. absorption. I've looked for the absorb the bioavailability of eggshell, and you can't find it anywhere at all. In mm. humans, it might be down at thirty percent or so, but I'd have thought dogs would be a bit better because they've got better acid. But I can't find a figure. Any, you guys seen a figure for eggshell? The actual bioavailability. It. Also looked for never never saw that. No. Um, and if I, anything, I know it's used as a phosphate binder, which is often why it's. Um, advocated for cats in you know, renal disease renal and things disease. like that uh, yeah. as calcium, uh, you know, because it's got that phosphate binding um, mm. option. But realistically, it is something that I've gone away from. Uh, I know Pit Ken used to be a big advocate of grinding down yeah. 15 different things within the diets that you then had to add in every single meal. Mm. And, you know, as, as anybody who's followed us for any length of time will know, we totally sort of ditch that to a bit more variety and, and giving accessibility to minerals and nutrients uh, uh, at different times uh, through the cycle of feeding. So, you know, Beth, I wouldn't be, uh, as these guys wouldn't be saying, oh, 
actually you're deficient because you're not giving eggshell. I think actually what's in eggshell is probably fairly limited, if anything. It's better than nothing, probably. But as uh, as Mindy says, what about bone meal? Bone meal is the kind of the the result of rendering. You know, so your your mm. your fat and gloops floats to the top for your jellies and soap as i always say and and the bone sinks to the bottom and you know pet food companies call that meat meal or dried meat but gardeners would call it bone meal so it's it's bone meal and that has been processed under high temperature and uh, high pressure and you'd probably say look it's probably it's probably a source of calcium and gloop but the fat has been removed and all that joint and cartilage stuff so it's probably mm. a quite a poor version of calcium as well to be honest in, in my opinion there is a substitute um, there was a product coming out in New Zealand called MCH Calcium. And this is what the sports people are taking, M for mother CH Calcium. So MCH Calcium is, is, a, is probably the top rated calcium supplement for absorption. And what it is, is ground up bones. Now, in my opinion... It's from where? From what, from what, from, what from source? From grass-fed New Zealand cattle. Oh, okay. Uh, Hydrolyzed? Uh, it looks like white dishwasher powder. It's extremely, it's actually way finer than dishwasher powder. It's like, it's so refined, I'd look going, but what their boast is, is that it is. Oh, uh, oh, oh. Be like, be like, a bit like this bit, stuff. Bit because like, this yeah. is, you know, um, you know, it can be grass fed, uh, organic, you know, all the rest but of that's it. That's just the but fact. I though. always wonder. I always mm. wonder when you um, are hydrolyzing this protein down to make it the peptides, okay, yeah. uh, from the collagen, whether actually you are damaging it. I yeah, always sure. wonder. Like you know, you must, must be. You yeah, must be. Surely. Yeah. But the, With that in uh, mind, guys, I would suggest that I'm, I'm going back to real basics here. I would be thinking sprats. You know that sprats, white bait yeah. has more more available calcium even than milk, which is a pretty good source of yeah. of, of calcium. White bait, yeah. So if you go to the restaurant and you, and you want a bit of calcium, white bait is the way to go. Be careful of the stuff they put on the outside, the batter. But that's another yeah don't fish. give them in battle with with seed oils and what have you let's yeah. not go there devil the, the devil hateful <laughs> late. the hateful late yeah. takes me back to air Christmas. dried air dried but, sprats um, will do you. Yeah. air dried sprats i think is about as good as you can get because the bones are so fine your 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 stomach your dog's stomach is just going to whiz through those so so easily and it's going to liberate that calcium so beautifully as long yeah. as uh, as well as iodine and zinc and all those amazing things that you will inevitably find in marine animals so for yeah. me those little dried sprats or sprats of any description really would be the place yeah. to go. I think if you're relying on eggshells, something like sprats or sardines would be wonderful. Michelle Fitzsimmons yeah. has just highlighted a really important point, depending on who's selling the MCH calcium, they will say it's freeze dried. And I will say, uh, 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 you're not allowed to sell non heat treated bone anywhere. You so you're not allowed to package it and sell it anywhere because it's a considered a hazardous item. So it's got to be cooked. It's that bone marrow. It's that bone marrow that they anything, feel anything from carry mad cow's disease. Mad oh, cow. Yeah. 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 So like you know, from bones, you know, give me a break. But, Lymphatics. But, okay, maybe. But uh, anyway, so they they will say freeze dried because at a final step, you can freeze dry the product as a preservation method, and it's a wonderful way of preserving. Which means the product doesn't need chemicals to ship it from New Zealand to here. So if they freeze dry down this powder, it's a great idea, fantastic. But the thing is, if you ask any freeze drying company, any freeze drying company anywhere, or even cold press, we cook our foods at 40 degrees, do you? How do you kill the bacteria? And they'll go, oh, well, we use natural preserves. How did you kill the bacteria in your product? And then they'll say, well, we have a, a heating step. We don't call it cooking. We call it a bacteria kill step. So all mm. cold pressed foods and freeze dried foods that say they don't cook, it's rubbish. You can't, you have to kill the bacteria. You have to get them to zero first, unless you're using chemicals and nobody wants to admit to that. So there has mm. to be a heat kill step. So yes, it's freeze dried, but that's a preservation method to get it from A to B rather than cooking it and then piling it full of chemicals because it's it's meat essentially. It's meat, it's protein, meat protein that wants to rot. So as, as Brian said, it was alive and then you kill it by. So there is a bit of cooking and uh yeah. So anyway, that's. I the, think br the, bone broth gets us around a lot of those problems because yes, it, mm. there, there is a heat kill step, but it only goes to 100 degrees unless you yeah. uh, unless you're putting it in great 90 fats yeah 90 the pressure up. Unless you're using a pressure cooker. Or oh, unless you're using a pressure cooker, in which case you can get it cooker. to 120. So, so basically, just yeah. you you, uh, you will take it up to the boil. That's 100. Then you'll bring it down to, to a simmer. Is a simmer 90? I no, a simmer is 90, thought, and a pressure cooker reduces the temperature. No, you, no, don't, you need less. No. The, the more pressure, the less up. temperature. No, is it not? Wrong way around. Boils, mate. Wrong way boils, around. If you, if you if you go up Mount Everest, your tea will be lukewarm. 
Yeah, boils at six. Because it that's because it's a long walk and it's cold. <laughs> <laughs> Surely. He's using a thermo glass. I'm confused. <laughs> it's Is a it long way up this mountain with a cup of tea in your hands. <laughs> I told you you were wrong. Um, I told you you need a better thermo. <laughs> yeah. They said my um, tea would be cold. I'd stick my tongue, my tongue. I'd stick my tongue out if it hadn't frozen off. But like, what's saying, the point? Oh, in... It's just because there's snow on the mountain top. That's what it. Is. What's the point in, in in pressure cooking if it doesn't bloody it, reduce it the means you can take the temperature of water it's up quicker. beyond 100 degrees and therefore you reduce the cooking time. Oh, you can take it to 120 or 130. Oh. Yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, I'm Seriously. surprised. <laughs> I thought I thought it saved it saves people in the 50s no, money the on gas. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I think a simmer. To, to, I mean, are there any physicists there? I hope there are. I thought a, a simmer was boiling water, and boiling water is more or less 100 degrees at, uh, at standard temperature and pressure. Is what, that correct? What, oh, really funny Murray, is it's called boil's law. Yeah, the <laughs> boil's law. The new P scientist P comes out. And boils law, P guys. equals VT. <laughs> is it uh, uh, Fiona? Is it P equals VT? Was it P oh, equals V go. over T? <laughs> Talk about Brady's law. Please. I'm always right. Look, Charlotte yeah. Davies says you can actually slow cook at high pressure. Uh, so there you go. There's a there's a there's an answer. But anyway, look, that was the calcium thing. But there's there's uh, um, although we're probably uh, I'm sure somebody else has a bit here. But I was wanted to have a quick word about non-steroidal anti-inflammatories. Okay, so I think as as step one of things to do if you know you get this diagnosis and you know your dog is usually a bit older because for the first few years, muscles can take over and keep you kind of steady and whatnot. And then as you get older, it just gets harder and harder and inflammation builds and the dog starts to go lame. Is that true uh, that the muscles will take up? So this is a this is an older dog issue, I assume, unless like my old dog, Meg, the poor thing at six or seven, she was hobbled with this issue. Mm -hmm. But it's not the end of the world. So I think kind of step one is like, you know, uh, the simple things to tick the simple boxes of chronic hip dysplasia, lean that dog up this is a long most of these breeds are long distance running animals so have them really really lean mo farah versus hussein bolt if any of your dogs look like that and you look at mo farah and you go where is the bloody weight on that guy how does he move 26 miles uh so really lean long distance running animals take the weight off the joints which would surely be a number one and all the other simple kind of things i mean there is a million uh, natural bits and pieces that you can put in that but let's just just keep him past the natural bits and pieces that we might have time to come we might do them in the in the bit on the side because i've got mm. some cool stuff to say about frankincense mm. actually and curcumin you should see the studies on turmeric mm. oh my god mm. for arthritis and whatnot but just to the non-steroidal anti-inflammatories for you guys we know that non-steroidal anti-inflammatories uh, have a really big problem downwind so they cause loads of gut issues yeah i think we're all pretty clear on that non-steroidal anti-inflammatories uh, cause bleeding inflammation ulceration of the stomach and small intestine big big problems and whatnot okay so living on them for a long term is probably not exactly ideal because they're going to upset your gut and your gut flora fueling inflammation and more and NSAIDs are probably going to be needed and whatnot but listen to this this is interesting um uh although non-steroidal anti-inflammatory that's like you know from paracetamol or uh, aspirin ibuprofen and metacam all those dudes um uh, while they induce gastropathy which is a patty of the stomach i guess and enteropathy of the intestines has been recognized for some time investigators more recently suggested that such effects may originate due solely to dysbiosis that is not, so, not solely due mm -hmm. due to dysbiosis mm -hmm. that is per perturbations in the gut microbiome that loads of studies another one non-steroidal uh, anti-inflammatory enteropathy does not occur in germ-free mice but when insert two bacteria names i can't pronounce are introduced intestinal ulceration occurs so, wow yeah and That's i was thinking good. bloody hell and then they finished that study with saying so when something is introduced to help let's say because chondroitin glucosamine doesn't upset the gut flora but chondroitin does so what they're saying was, okay, it shifts the gut flora, but what's the actual impact on the animal? So, for example, a dog with degenerative joint disease will have a certain gut flora because he's inflamed and in pain. And when you put in chondroitin, which can mask a bit of the pain and help the dog a bit, the gut flora shifts. That's not necessarily a negative thing. It may not even be that the con it's not that the bacteria were affected by the chemical fed. It was the relief of the inflammation that settle the dog and shift at the gut floor so they don't know if it's the chemical the non-steroidal anti-inflammatory that's affecting the gut floor or the relief of the symptoms and the fixing because the bacteria are so involved in fixing gut membranes and everything else i just thought how wonderfully confused it is uh, but it 
doesn't sound good for non-steroidal anti-inflammatory use. So how do you guys treat, if everyone has done everything right, the basic stuff we've talked about before, getting the dog well-fed, fish oil, you know, your natural solutions we'll talk about later on, really lean, healthy, you know, therapies and, and hydrotherapy and, and, and all these sort of things you can do. If you have to go c conventional, and that's where we are with these chemicals, where do people have, where do you go? What's, step, what's level two? I've got a, I've got a list from uh, Gene Dodds here actually, and I'm just wanting it's it's nine forty one, so I'm going to just tease everybody with this, and then we can maybe go into a bit on the side and maybe go into one or two of them uh, a bit more. So Gene Dodds in her wonderful book Canine Nutrigenomics, page one hundred and thirty, she's saying omega three fatty acids with the provisos that Connor so um, eloquently uh, described earlier, but then she also says about other things to look at are uh the first one is actually deer velvet okay which is the deer velvet here so that's a really interesting one. one to just really really get into that and actually talking of that i've got i've got this book it is a book in a digital format when i'm going to put that up on um patreon OK, so you'd be able to look at that. Then there's there's 500 plus um, references in there for you to have a look at. But that's not why I'm giving the list. She also talks about green lip muscle extract, glucosamine, chondroitin, vitamin A, vitamin C, vitamin E, S, adenosylmethionine. That's the liver one. She took she highlights spirulina. Um, she highlights curcumin. Uh, Connor was just saying about curcumin and the, 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 the figures. It's very anti-inflammatory and very good for uh, joints. Even grape seed extract, uh, green or black tea leaf extract, MSM, methyl sulfonyl methane, uh, DL phenylalanine, and homeopathic remedies such as tromiel or zeal, Z E E L. Lots and lots of things to think about. Bren, any thoughts on that list before we jump into uh, so Patreon? So many. Um, yeah. Remember, some of the herbs that we're going to talk about, um, Devil's Claw is a classic, Ooh. can act in a very similar way to non-steroidals. If you're using both together, be really aware of side effects, okay? And do consult with your vet. Hopefully your holistic vet will give you some uh, insights into that. Um, many people will uh, see salicylic acid in some of these supplements and effectively they're giving aspirin alongside the uh, supplement and then won't realize they're also giving uh, a non-steroidal, which actually they are contraindicated to use the two together. Um, so just be aware, some of the herbs will act in very similar ways. Really interesting. There are such a range of non-steroidal anti-inflammatories. And I know that we posted up very quickly that there was a, um, a study there where you can see degradation of joints with non-steroidals. And certainly some of the early non-steroidals would wipe out not just the nasty inflammatory um, prostaglandins, but they would actually also wipe out the protective prostaglandins so studies like that absolutely right will cause that and that's partly why you also get degradation in intestinal lining is there is a level of prostaglandins that are required as protection uh, there is how it was thought now it's really interesting you say that certain bacteria can aggravate that condition and i wonder whether that's you know another interaction at an at an, an yeah another level that we need to look at um, yeah. because there'll be a level of protection um, that should be afforded. So there are some later generations, one like Simalgex and things like that, which are now, even for dogs with diarrhea, supposed to be in there as a possible medication. I would honestly say, look, in the very short term, if you've got a lame dog, giving a very short course of a good, well-known analgesic to assess, is this directly just down to pain or is there a physical reason why this dog is lame? Is considered uh, an appropriate action rather than necessarily immediately knocking them out and doing 15 tests under anesthesia and uh, you know looking at x-rays and imaging and everything else you know just doing a simple pain relief test is worth it but there are some great studies you know um vet pro and uh, nutrivet released a multimodal with um 
Boswellia, which is frankincense, um, in there alongside some other herbal uh, constituents to protect the liver. You know, those are options uh, that have been shown to be as good as some of the non-steroidal drugs out there. So there are options to have a look at um, and realize every animal is an individual. And therefore, just as with some people, um, you might find that they're better with one anti-inflammatory than another. You know, the same with these herbal medicines. Don't go, oh, it didn't work with Boswellia, therefore I'm not going to bother with anything else herbal. Yeah. Um, you know, you might want to move to golden paste. You might want to use just pure turmeric. You might want to use green lip. But hands down, the biggest jump I think you'll see is using a good source of omega-3 um, within the diet. And that is uh, probably the biggest jump uh, to benefit uh, sore joints. There's a, there's a okay. non-steroidal anti-inflammatory there, Bren. Uh, the, the old versions of them were like we grew up with Medicam. That's what my old girl was on, and Rimadil. I managed to keep her off it until she was like 13, and then she needed it again. But, I mean, the vet had her on her at 7 when she was really hobbled with it. I was like, bloody hell. But the new one here, Galaprant here, I'm just reading... Uh, it doesn't block prostaglandin production. Pro you want prostaglandins, like isn't, blocking them wasn't a good idea because it has this effect of ulceration and they, they were important for that process, which I poorly mm -hmm. understand. But Galaprant doesn't block prostaglandin production, good news, but it blocks the receptors for that. And that's why uh, that is becoming a very uh, popular drug, not because it's under patent, of course. Yeah. What about that? Sounds brilliant. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Sounds brilliant. But on the ground, just as likely, just as possible to cause diarrhea and gastric upset in dogs. Bloody hell. So there you go. Shit on that. So it sounds brilliant. Yeah. But experience in the clinic, okay, I would definitely say um, I've seen as many dogs with gastric upsets on Galapran as I have any other non steroidal yeah. that's out there. In, in relation to the mm. fish oil thing, just to throw a cat among the pigeons here, this, this, the green lip muscle, you know, it's great and all that, but you don't get a lot of omega 3 bang for your buck. It's complicated. I don't have time to get into it. It's phospholipids versus triglycerides. I'm only after learning this myself. But as it turns out, you you know it's very hard to beat fish oil and that's just a fact when it comes to omega-3 bang for your book very very hard nothing really gets close but then you've got different problems with the food and the size of the fish and chemicals that they, they, they accumulate bioaccumulate and all this core crap yes yeah, so i get all that but listen to this a study of omega-3 sources fish oil krill oil and green lip muscle green lip muscle did the worst when it was fighting cytokine mediated canine cartilage degradation. So in other words, an inflammation, uh, cartilage damage due to inflammation in the joints. The GLM came out the worst. Now, of course, you always have to wonder who wrote that study? Was it the person that hates uh, GLM? Yeah. So you don't um, what on what level of green lip muscle was it? Yeah, exa because exactly. was it fresh oil? Yeah, was it exactly uh, all that? So, but it isn't it yeah. like Brent said though don't just stick to one maybe this fish oil didn't work for you maybe try another one you don't have to have all the signs of exactly mm. the fish oil you're looking at don't stress yourself out go by a recommendation but don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. try something else try a different green lip muscle extract mm -hmm. because they're produced differently you get different bang for your book you might get a 500 milligram tablet or a thousand milligram tablet and you'll think the thousand milligram tablet is twice as good but as i said in a previous rpm they just put in 50 percent rice filler into the into the capsule so you think you're buying a stronger glm capsule but all you've bought is more filler it's got the same amount of glm extract in it rotten to the core this industry so mm. don't definitely don't trust just one of those oils because that oil industry is very funny mm. right uh, boys I'll, let's I'll jump over shall we? we go over to, yeah just before we jump over i would always say i think if it's got a long chemical name um just be cautious think about it there are lots of alternatives first, um, you know, giving one element out of a whole mix of things that could be found in nature, I think has consequences. I, yeah. I much prefer uh, some of the benefits you get with some of the plants and herbs that we're talking about is not just a pure extract, but it can be the whole herb. So do have a look at the different options. They may have some gastric protection, liver protection, et cetera, if you're giving the whole herb rather than just an individual item. And everyone's saying broth there. Broth is definitely a brilliant broth idea. Is definitely for for anyone there. that doesn't follow us over yeah. to uh, pa yeah. patreon.com forward slash wallpetmedics, where we do another 15 minutes. Uh, the, the broth is brilliant. It's just stewed up um, joint goo fed oh. to you. So mm. it's wonderful. And so absolutely use broth uh, any other way. Ian Rooney was saying that. And so check out his comments there. Then he asked, what about plants? 
fan to us. GLA is good for joints. Studies do show it's effective, but they're studies of humans. And what we're, we have a problem with in a lot of dogs is that they're deficient in omega-3. And if you keep on jacking in omega-6, you're going to throw out that ratio and fuel inflammation. So you have this balance of, does my dog have enough omega-3? There's actually a test out there. It only costs $40. There's a test to see, check your omega-3 status. And so you can you can tell if you really want to be fiddly and just find out what your dog's omega-3 is. How well is your raw diet doing? Send your dog for an omega-3 status. That'll tell you. And so if you start adding an omega-6 to a dog that needs omega-3, you're in big trouble. And then your GLA effect will go out the window. Anyway. Okay. And I've got a quiz. I've got a quiz for you. Uh, and I will give you the answer on the other side. It is how good for you is deoxyribose nucleic acid? Answer on a postcard or over <laughs> over in the <laughs> Patreon, please. How good is that for you? Could you survive without it? Here we go. Very good. Brilliant. Talk to you soon, guys. Cheers. Take care. Speak to you next week. Oh, which is Epilepsy and nutrition, Ooh, just so that you know. Remember, it. it's epilepsy and nutrition love next it. week. Cool. Love it, love it, love See it. See you over on Bit on the Side. The Other Side. Good